some of which involve leeches, some of which involve ground glass, um, and they would provide what people are looking for, but I can't help feeling they'd be a little bit ouchy. Just a bit. Greetings, I'm Shad, and not only am I here at the Abbey Medieval Festival, I am here with Rosalie Gilbert. Yes. Gilbert, you have an interesting interest in regards to the medieval period, something a bit more specific, you could say. A bit more secret. A uh, bit more secret? A bit more secret, a bit more uh, secret lady thing. Because <laughs> you you, you you're an author of a book, and the book is called, it was Secrets of... The Very Secret, secret Sex Lives. Lives of Medieval Women. We're clearly going to be talking about sex or things related to it because it obviously comprises an important part of history. That's how we're alive today. Because Rosalie has such a breadth of knowledge, there was some questions I wanted to, know, to know, learn about in regards to that. Also, women in the medieval period and other things as well. So to kick us right off, uh, what kind of got you interested in this subject, medieval history essentially, and this aspect of it? Uh, well, a very long time ago, we did mm. uh, the family history tree thing mm -hmm. uh, before it all became a thing that everybody did. And there's a, a castle that the mm. Gilbert family still live in over in Compton, called uh, Compton Castle. And so there was a little bit of history there that got me a little bit interested. You see some of the pictures, the the clothes and the effigies and the, mm. the um, tombs and you start going, oh, that's that's interesting. Then I accidentally went to a festival one day and it was full of these people doing doing this amazing stuff. And I wanted to make the clothes and have a go, as you see many people here today mm. making the clothes and having a go, which led to questions about underpants, which led to questions <laughs> about what about that time of the month? Mm -hmm. And once you start going down that road, there's a lot of medical beliefs that tie mm -hmm. in with sexual health and menstruation. There's also a lot of misconceptions around, uh, well, not only, I guess, medieval period, but especially gendered roles, the nature of how people deal with uh, every number of things, including uh, underwear and stuff. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and so you, you dived in to try and uh, learn more about that. I take it as well. I have questions. I'm very nosy. Mm -hmm. So something else I wanted to comment on, because you have a, what looks to be a very authentic outfit as well, and what's striking to me is particularly what you have here. What is it called specifically what you're wearing? Uh, to cover your... This is this is a barbette. A barbette. Yes. That's very interesting because there is a, a very common helmet called a barbute. Uh, so, but that is a barbette. It is. Uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine is mm. credited with bringing them to the ladies of the world. As she got a little bit older, the story goes that her jowls became a little <laughs> saggier. Yes. And this is, this is essentially your medieval face Face lift. <laughs> I heard that as well. It kind of tucks it all back. It's back no in. joke. I actually put a picture mm -hmm. of me. Here I am without and here I am with. And everyone went, oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and part of it as well is, depending on uh, the period and region, uh, having the hair uncovered was considered immodest at certain times. And is this part of uh, that kind of, uh, you know, utility to keep the hair covered? Absolutely. Being mm -hmm. a decent woman was uh, very important. And even when you were having marital relations, you needed to keep your head covered. That ties into <laughs> even, yes. even to that far? I yes. didn't know that. Yes, uh, because what happens is you lose a lot of heat through your head. Mm -hmm. So it was medically important that if you're going to engage in a bit of, you know, frisky bedroom activity, you needed to have your head covered. Now you could go with a veil, a coif, uh, look, hair net, it will let the hair out, but it does show you making an effort. And that's, that's what's important, lady. Absolutely. In regards to uh, this, it's a uh, barbette, is it? Yes. So, so do you know what regions are more commonly worn and what time period? Uh, you see them in the early 14th century, mm -hmm. so uh, you see them a lot before 1350. Mm -hmm. uh, so late 12th century, early 13th, mm -hmm. you see them a lot. English and French manuscripts uh, extensively. Mm -hmm. um, Europe as well, but um, I mainly look at the English and French mm -hmm. manuscripts and they are um, very, very common. It's, it's the thing that you see, sometimes with a veil out in the back at a very mm. improbable angle. And then <laughs> later on, they sort of toned it down to a koi for a St. Bagurta's koi. Mm -hmm. uh, but the hairnet was a, a big staple for a long time and they could be embroidered with coats of arms and they could be quite high end. <laughs> One area that you could show a lot of was the decollete. You could mm -hmm. do that. And the mm -hmm. rule there is a decent woman doesn't have a dress cut lower than her armpit. 
Uh, but your armpit is sort of here, mm -hmm. so that's actually quite low. Uh, it does. It gets you a bit can like actually, it. and as long as it's not lower than your armpit, mm -hmm. you're still decent. And that came mm -hmm. from a queen. Yes, yeah. Um, so no one could pick you up for being uh, a little bit um, on the naughty side. Um, as long as you met that, and that's, that's mm -hmm. quite a lot of bosom. I've seen a lot of bosom this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also seen in art as well in different yes, times. Yes, yes, you do see a lot of that. In other mm -hmm. times, you have the, the higher neck and the wimple to cover it all up, mm -hmm. which is more appropriate for the older lady. Ah, yes. Uh, but certainly it was not scandalous to have a lower cut in the mm -hmm. later 14th century. All right, so you like to study the, the secret sex lives of many women. What are some of those secrets that you would be interesting to share with, with the audience? audience that, that might give them a preview also to things in your book as well. Well, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise is that uh, good loving was necessary for a woman's health because what they thought was that the womb wandered around the body collecting toxins uh, and at the once a month we would purge those toxins and mm -hmm. we'll know about that <laughs> but how you actually got the womb to come back to the right area was with some good loving well, so there we go if, if your yep. husband didn't actually provide that good loving in some circumstances you could take him to court and divorce him really yes and there was what does a bedroom mm -hmm. trial there had to be witnesses <laughs> We know this because they're actually recorded in court cases. Yep. Who said what, who was there, how old they were. You know. Uh, the matrons around the bed. <laughs> I, I kind of like that law. It sounds like a uh, sounds like a decent decent you know thing. In, in, I, yeah, I, I see it. There were some issues because the wise women that you gathered to judge the situation weren't just silent observers. They were allowed to touch him and they were allowed to help. <laughs> they were allowed to. Uh, they weren't silent. They were allowed to say things like, "Come on, John, prove yourself a man." <laughs> While, while strange women are fondling his bits and getting his hands and touching them and saying, come on. <laughs> and uh, these bedroom trials went on for more than one night. Really? So after several nights. So they have to make up for lost time, do they? After <laughs> several nights of this, if he still couldn't perform in front of this encouraging <laughs> crowd, um, then perhaps they might be best parted. Wow. So which area does that come from? Because I've, I've never heard anything like that. Uh, London. London. Paris. Paris. Uh, I believe there's a German Why does record that, as well. For some yeah. reason, it just makes sense for Paris for some reason. <laughs> French. Yeah. Ooh la la. Yeah. We like the love. And, and obviously, that mm -hmm. doesn't apply to um, women in rural villages who had no idea that that was even a thing. Mm -hmm. You needed mm -hmm. to know about it and you need to be rich enough to take someone to court. Well, <laughs> that's one of the things that I kind of have learned from you know looking at the medieval period that it's there's a lot of practices that you can learn and hear of but then to apply it too broadly is of course where it goes right sometimes these practices are actually quite secluded to either the class that you're a part of or the area and time period that you came from and so this is a very interesting practice but of course you wouldn't want to apply it over the entire medieval period because one of the practices i also have I have come across and this is an accurate one but i haven't pinned down exactly where it comes from about um if a lord was getting married and it was an arranged marriage, they wanted to make sure that the uh, the uh, the uh, union was consummated and and the family members would make sure it happened and they would either stand outside the room or sometimes even around the bed just to make sure that this is a consummated marriage and uh, an heir might be on the way. Yes, we know we know that's true because there are also court cases <laughs> where people um, perhaps weren't enjoying their arranged marriages and wanted to escape because they found someone a bit more comely or perhaps a whole lot richer. <laughs> uh, so they've tried to say, look, the marriage wasn't consummated. And then there are court mm -hmm. cases where witnesses are called. No, I was there. This was said. These noises were heard <laughs> from the bedroom. <laughs> There was boasting the next morning. You know, she said to me as a lady, he said to his men, you know, mm -hmm. I have done. So witnesses were produced. It was very serious and they did, were very keen to have people to confirm mm -hmm. that things had taken place as they should, just to make sure that things were heading in the right direction. And I can understand the viewpoint. If this is actually a very politically important union and marriage and then someone's wanting to you know, get out of there, yes. yeah, they would want confirmation on it. And so it's not that medieval people had a different kind of perverse outlook about relationships. They had a different outlook that often came from the culture that they lived in and the natural processes that they weren't stupid, they weren't strange. They were trying to achieve 
everything that kind of we achieve, but in the world that they lived in is, is what I gather when I look at this stuff. One thing, one interesting thing that I have, especially when you talked about it, it was the man's duty to, uh, to uh, make sure the wife was able to reset her, her cycle, which is a very interesting thing. Yes. It, it, it speaks about the theories that they have around um, the medicine at the time, the, the theory of the four humors and things. Yes. Um, one thing that I, that I have a bit of question then, and so because a lot of the medieval period, of course, it, it, mainly in Europe is where you find they, they were far more Catholic, and yes. depending on how orthodox they were, they they would only uh, you know have those relationships for the purpose of you know, procreating, having children, and stuff, uh, and having doing it for fun was generally a no no in the more orthodox kind of realms of Catholicism back in the day. How does that kind of fit in with the the expectation that you know the woman needs to reset the, her cycle? Was there conflict in regards to those practices? Um, there were conflicts if she really didn't want them to happen. <laughs> uh, he might be there like, come on, darling, for your good health. You yeah. <laughs> she'd be like, they're going, oh. So there, there were loopholes, but there were also things that she could do uh, to make that happen if she was a chaste woman, if she was a nun or she had taken a vow of um, chastity. Mm -hmm. uh, those things could still be addressed a certain way without his intervention, very sadly, for him. Really? Yes. Well, I'm interested to learn about those, but just kind of ending off on that point about um, uh, the, the the different religious standards that might have existed, I could definitely see it was probably a bit hard to, for, you know, the religious uh, authorities to try and police uh, the, the correct type of procreation if it's for conceiving or, or just, uh, they couldn't really police that. Oh, yes, they did. Oh, did they? Yes, they uh, did. Okay, yeah, fill me in. Yes, they did. Okay, so what they did was, uh, not only did they make up a really exhaustive list of places and times you couldn't have relations with someone you were actually married to, um, they also decided that they can't make up ridiculous rules if they weren't going to police them. So they did, they made up these fantastic confessors manuals for the um, confessionals. And a lot of those were exceptionally explicit. And if you didn't have ideas about things before you went there, they would say to you, have you done this thing? And you would go, I didn't even know of that thing. I have not. You yeah. Keep that one for later, babe. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Writing for letting down me know. these ideas, thank you. But they would they would grill them. They would say, mm. have you done this? And we know these from the confessor's manuals mm -hmm. when they say, you know, for this crime, this is the penance. Wow. And often for the same misdemeanor, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe helping yourself on a lonely late night, uh, the penalty for a man was different to the penalty for a woman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, depending on how the church felt about who was sinning the worst. Mm. And I, I also okay. imagine there was probably different penalties for your station in society as well and whatever influence you could get to to escape. Was that the case sometimes? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, because sometimes if you had a lot of money, you got away with a lot of things mm -hmm. just because you, you could. <laughs> That's the unfortunate reality. So that, that's so yeah, they actually did try and police even that. Yeah, they I, actually did. Wow, a lot of heavy policing. Uh, they sent them out into the world after the plague. They had a lot of very young clergy, and they mm -hmm. sent them out there with these confessors' manuals, going, <laughs> "You've got to ask them this stuff." And if you read through some of the questions they asked, and I mentioned some of those, mm -hmm. um, some of them are weirdly specific, <laughs> and you find yourself going, "Who's who's doing that?" <laughs> Why did you write it down that we should ask everyone? Because surely there may be one person's doing that, but well, not everyone. But, but that's the thing. Like, if someone wrote it down, that is evidence that at least someone must have done it. Do they take it, take it to a meeting and go, we need to vote on this? Do you reckon lots of people are doing this? Is this on the list? Do we leave this one out or include it? <laughs> that's because amazing. some of the things they included are horrendous. Really? Yes. Did you want to give us one example of maybe the horrendous ones? Depending uh, if it's YouTube, so uh, we'll it see. It is not YouTube. Friend. Okay. Okay. It's, it's not. I'm sorry to say. That just um, leaves it up to my imagination. That's even worse. Very invasive. Really? Very oh invasive. wow. Okay. Then yeah, just then, stop. Then stop. All right. All right. That, that gives me enough information. <laughs> this is really interesting because obviously, with the how religious the period was, there was definitely a practice and encouragement for for chastity. But people are also people, and so even though there would have been the pious people, and then the people who just. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning that as a result, there were certain ways to um, uh, kind of uh, trick the test because there were actual tests for virginity you, you were mentioning? Um, 
what I was talking about yeah. earlier was not so much a test for virginity, yeah. but ways that you could fake being a virgin again. Oh. <laughs> uh, so if you had been a little bit careless uh, in your youth and you wish to preserve a modest virginal bride on the wedding night, mm. obviously there are signs that they would look for. Mm. Um, they, they would expect a certain amount of things to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so you needed to be able to produce those things to happen and perhaps um, you might like to um, brighten and tighten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. The areas you might want to be using for that mm -hmm. and there, there were ways to do that. Um, and, and this was written down? Yes. Really? Yes. So, so are these just some like, I don't know, yes. is this a book they just handed amongst each other just to hide from the clergy, but yeah, to help no, you? No, no, a lot of it came through um, uh, secret women's texts <laughs> and other things were, were very helpful, perhaps if you had been a lady, uh, a professional lady who made a living uh -huh. a certain way. Yep, yep. Um, and wished to marry as a respectable girl, you, mm -hmm. could, you could totally get hold of any of these things, uh, some of which <laughs> involve leeches some of which involve ground glass um, and they would provide <laughs> so, what people are looking for but I can't help feeling they'd be a little bit ouchy. Just a bit. For both people concerned. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd find the new husband going well clearly she is a lady who hasn't done this before because it, it didn't feel like this any other time. <laughs> That is like genuinely amazing. And this is also information that you rarely come across, but it shows uh, like these are people, okay? They are, they are, they are regular people mm -hmm. just like us. They face the same issues that we mm -hmm. did, yeah, with contraception and pregnancies and wooing and mm -hmm. avoiding the woo. Mm -hmm. um, there were many things they dealt with, uh, same as a lot of the things that we deal with today. Really intriguing. So in regards to like these kind of secret Fe like female books that you know uh, spread around did you get indication as to uh, what kind of class they're intended for like, like were these so even common women would be able to read them or it was mainly for the ladies who had an education because one of the misconceptions i like to always find a little bit more reference points on is about medieval literacy and i've always found that there's far more literacy rates in the medieval period than the the, the myth that they all didn't know how to read and when you find poetry that was actually written for the lower classes like well what who were they writing it for if a lot of romance novels and the target <laughs> audience was women exactly who would get together and read the romance novels to themselves you know the romances of lancelot mm -hmm. and king arthur and the romance of the roads Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of women did have a lot of literacy. The higher up you were, the more important it was that you could read and write. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to note that in the medieval period, you were illiterate if you couldn't read and write Latin. That's the key. That's so the key. a lot of people couldn't read and write Latin, mm -hmm. were therefore illiterate, but it doesn't mean that they couldn't read and write at all. That's the key thing that I try and point out because uh, everyone thinks, yeah, that it's illiteracy, but it's all, yeah, no, it's about it's Latin. Right, but in their right. local dialect, they often had quite a workable, functional level of literacy. That's right. Mm -hmm. So some of the information came uh, for doctors. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was passed on to some things. Others came through word of mouth from the, mm -hmm. um, from the wise women and the herbalists and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, other things came in health handbooks, which were about herbals. And a lot of information there is disguised in a way to say, certainly do not do this thing because these things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't do this Don't thing. Don't do this because... <laughs> this would happen. This incredibly helpful thing you might want to know will happen to you. I love it. That, that what's funny about that is that that's things people people do that in the modern day where they're just like, oh, the wink is like don't do that. Yes, you know? yes. I would <laughs> never tell you to do this thing. Here are the instructions and the recipe. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, so, was there another secret that you'd like to share that might be interesting to the audience? I guess the standard of hygiene was a lot higher than people think. Even women mm -hmm. in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Uh, had a lot of herbal remedies available to them mm -hmm. and people keep forgetting that cleanliness was next to godliness. Mm -hmm. And that's an old saying, that goes back how far? A very long time. Mm. And if your husband is a pig herder, you better believe he is cleaning up and barfing before he comes <laughs> anywhere near you. And one of the myths is that they say they barely bath, like once a month, once a week and everything like that. And uh, 
One, I've heard that actually is cases of being vastly more often. There are bathhouses in the city. It's oh just my like, Lord, you know, yes. crazy, people. crazy bathing people. Mm, oh yeah, and and then even going further, washing up before eating as well, making sure everything. Cleaning your hands mm. before eating was was a very widespread thing, generally mm. speaking. It was considered the, the polite thing to do. And a lot of people now wash your hands before dinner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a standard, standard thing. So you mentioned something about, uh, at the beginning of the conversation about types of underwear. So, so like, what types of underwear existed in the medieval period? I, I'm, I'm assuming you obviously know what the types for, for women, but also if you know what the men wore. Um, there's a lot more evidence for male underpants and mm -hmm. male trues. You see them a lot in mm -hmm. the... Um, in the 13th, 14th, 15th century manuscripts. But the things I like most of all are the 15th century male underpants, which are nothing short of a bikini brief, <laughs> often in bright blue, and almost right. everything doesn't tuck in. They're really quite brief. And uh, they're just sensational, and they're very often blue. That's Well, in the medieval period, men were very proud of their anatomy. And oh, the, those Germans with those... Cod pieces. <laughs> You Get just it? can't look away. <laughs> it's right in your face. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. <laughs> so it turns out that their underwear seemed to reflect that as well at times. Maybe they were just really excited to be wherever they went. <laughs> Good on them. They're, I'm going shopping. Hooray. You know, they're, they're proud, proud of themselves. <laughs> yeah, um, yes. Yes. They're, they're my favourites. I've made a pair of reproduction ones. <laughs> Um, and often, a lot of people may not notice if they're looking too closely, and I like to, um, <laughs> a lot of them tie up on one hip. So they're very much like a tie on bikini bottom, uh, which is just sensational. Who doesn't want to tie things on on the hip? That's funny. Um, well, there we go. Male, you know, fancy underwear. It was a thing in the medieval period. But that's the thing, like, you know, men also wear high heels in the medieval period. So it was mostly France and things, and, you know, there are cases like that. Um, so what about uh, female underwear as well, you know, because I've seen cases of brassieres existing in the medieval period of times. Um, yes and no. Yes and um, no. The bras that we tend to think of, a lot of the talk has come from the Lengberg bra, which is mm -hmm. not a bra per se. Mm -hmm. It's the top half of a supportive petticoat. Aha. So we suspect, looking at the stitching, that there was actually a, a mm -hmm. like a chemise part on the bottom. Mm -hmm. But the top part is very structured with two linen bags mm -hmm. for the breast to support you. Put them in and put they would give you mm. um, the fashionable medieval shape and they would enhance you in the right spot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, underpants, we know they wore them sometimes, mm -hmm. but not other times. Yeah, there are yeah. records of tailors' shops that were selling underpants, which were uh, a certain cost for men. And mm -hmm. the cost was to be no more for the men for the ladies' ones when nature forces her to do so. Aha. Uh -huh. So we know that at some times, she definitely did. Mm -hmm. uh, other times, um, there's a lot of evidence for maybe they didn't, mm -hmm. but you had a lot of layers on, possibly not that needed. Yeah, you know, um, get the nice breeze underneath as well. Definitely at times, see, it's really cold. Mm -hmm. I find myself wanting those extra layers even mm -hmm. here. It was mm -hmm. seven degrees last night and I wouldn't have wouldn't have not <laughs> it would be too breezy yeah. so these are like just all wonderful really interesting factoids in an area that not only have uh, i not of course studied in depth it's also much harder to find specific detailed information you, you've been referencing some sources that uh, i haven't even heard of and it's just really wonderful to actually get some information from things that you've been able to read um so to finish off on the video unless there's anything specific you'd like to say i was interested in going through some medieval contraceptions that might be i was just going to bring that up oh there we go I'm, I'm thinking one of the things you probably haven't heard of <laughs> medieval condoms with ribbons to tie them on <laughs> Really? That was the Italians. Do you know what they were made out of? Just um, out of interest. They were made out of linen, linen, and they were soaked in a certain chemical, which we don't know. They, mm -hmm. they didn't say, um, and they were to prevent STDs, not to okay. prevent pregnancy. Yeah. We don't care what happens to the women, um, and they were they were done in the late 15th century by a gentleman who did what essentially was a clinical trial. <laughs> he had a certain number of things mm -hmm. and none of the men who wore the device tied on with the festive ribbons uh, caught syphilis. So, oh, there we go. 
uh, that's very exciting because we know Romans had condoms and things like mm-hmm. that. But later on, there's a, a big gap where they sort of disappear from the record and then they reappear with a flourish and ribbons mm-hmm. uh, with the Italians a bit later on. Um, <laughs> otherwise, there were lots of other things you could do with mm-hmm. burgers. Um, you could, uh, lots of aphrodisiacs. Mm-hmm. If you're feeling a bit reluctant and mm-hmm. you need encouraging. Mm-hmm. A lady could just do those things and not tell you. You'd never know. <laughs> Put it in the dinner or the Would drink. You like some pie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is all absolutely wonderful. And so, if you guys would actually like to learn even more, Rosalie, she's got a whole novel. Would you? Where, do, could we have a look at that? It is the very secret, secret sex, sex lives of medieval women. <laughs> all that and more. All that and a lot more. Thank you very much, Rosalie. Thank you so much for talking to uh, me. My pleasure. It's been so much fun. Awesome. And of course, thank you guys for watching. Really appreciate it. And I hope to see you on the next video here on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell.